Hi everyone, I came across this fascinating earthquake study regarding ground accelerations in the Los Angeles area. I want to give you an overview of how they went about doing this study, what the implications are. So the other thing I wanted to do was to get into more of the details associated with the analytical method that I'm sure they used based on common engineering practices and physics. So they did a variety of studies to determine why these rock outcrops had not toppled over in prior earthquakes. So the study area was northeast of Los Angeles. It consists of a rock outcrop of granite, and this granite has a special weathering pattern that I'll describe here in a second. But it's a very novel approach that they took in this study, I think. So here's the area that we're talking about. Here's a Google Earth view of the location. Now, of course, we know Southern California has a high seismic hazard from the nearby San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas Fault moves every year. It's just ongoing as the plates slide past each other. They're called strike-slip faults. And uh, at some point, the city of Los Angeles will be out in the Pacific Ocean. So in designing buildings, bridges, other infrastructure, an important consideration in earthquake country is how much ground acceleration are you likely to get within a given time period. You don't want to design for the highest potential earthquake, but the highest likely earthquake in human timescale terms. Now here's an earthquake hazard map that's color coded. And the area of our study here is color graded from yellow to red, which indicates the number of times per century that an earthquake is likely to occur with ground accelerations in excess of 0.2 Gs. And at that level, 0.2 times the acceleration of gravity, you could expect significant damage to older buildings and other perhaps older bridges and other infrastructure in that fashion. So here's what these rock outcrops look like. They have a rounded shape because of the type of mechanical weathering that they've experienced, and that's called exfoliation. So granite can weather mechanically due to the action of water, particularly if it freezes, or even just differences of temperature. So take uh, overnight low temperatures in the morning, the sun comes out, starts warming the rock. The outer surface of the rock is warmer than the interior surface of the rock, so they expand at different rates. And the reverse occurs at night during cooling. And this cyclic thermal loading can cause, and does cause, pieces of the granite to spall off much like a sculptor using granite chips away at, at the marble to reveal the underlying shape over a period of time. That's how this uh, material weathers out, out in the uh, elements. So you can see that these rock outcrops have a taper. They get smaller at the base. So basically what they decided to do was measure the size of these granite outcrops so that they can compute the mass so if you know the volume times the density, you know, you know the mass. And uh, they also looked at the base of the pedestal. And in order to get these rocks to topple, you have to have a certain loading or acceleration. And that causes the upper portion of the rock outcrop to tilt, which puts the, the pedestal at the base in tension. And as we know, concrete, rock, and other materials are weaker in tensile loading than they are in compressive loading. So if you measure the dimensions carefully and take a typical tensile strength for granite, although I'm sure they took rock cores and actually measured what the tensile strength of this rock was out at the site, and typical tensile strength values for granite range from 1,000 to 3,600 pounds per square inch. So if you take that tensile strength over the area at the base, you can compute the force that would be required to break that rock. So using basic physics, force equals mass times acceleration. And they're interested in solving for the acceleration component that would cause this rock to break and topple over. So we, we know the force, we know the mass, and we can compute the acceleration. And so when they did that, they came up with ground accelerations or required accelerations to topple the rock at values that were far lower than those typically used for design for buildings and other structures in the Los Angeles area. One other aspect of the study, which was really fascinating, you have to look at a period of time to get an idea of the potential range in earthquake magnitude. So if I were just to go out there and say, hey, what are the odds of a magnitude eight earthquake in the next five minutes? It would be very low. 
if I said, what's the odds of a magnitude eight earthquake in 50,000 years, it would be much higher. In fact, you would expect multiple instances where that occurred. So what they found was obviously these rocks are still standing and the acceleration values that they computed should have been exceeded in the past. And, and they weren't, which means that the ground accelerations used for design appear to be higher than what's actually the case. So how did they get the, the age component? They drilled core samples in the rock and they measured the relative concentration of barium-10 isotope against the daughter element, the decay element of uh, boron. And uh, beryllium-10 has a half-life of 1.5 million years. So they were able to determine essentially when these configurations of the rock in its current form more or less took place. Uh, anywhere from say a few thousand years up to 50,000 years. So what happens is cosmic radiation causes the formation of beryllium isotope from a beryllium atom and then it starts to decay over, over time. So in this way they were able to compute approximately how long that surface had been in that configuration based on the concentration of the isotopes. Now I will say just coming up with the ground acceleration is one component because the effects of acceleration are either dampened or magnified based on the subsurface conditions. So you can imagine a bowl of jelly and uh, if you shake the bowl, there's a lot of movement occurring with the jelly. And uh, so if you have thick, unconsolidated, loose sands or soft clays that are significantly deep, say like you have in Mexico City or in parts of Los Angeles, the amount of acceleration can really impact the structure versus something that's say resting on bedrock. So here's some pictures of these rock outcrops. So they put what looks like some type of post-it note so they can use photography to calculate the volume of the rock. So as I said, I think this study is quite clever and novel. I wanna cite the researcher, the lead researcher, it's Anna Rood, who's a seismic hazard scientist at the Global Earthquake Model Foundation. So I expect other locations throughout the world are gonna use this type of methodology to better refine their estimates of likely ground acceleration associated with an earthquake on a nearby fault. So I hope you enjoyed this. This was a little more science oriented compared to previous videos, but I think it's fascinating and it just shows you the relationship between engineering and geology and how, you know, sometimes disciplines that you might not think could have a bearing on how things are designed can, can be very important. You know, they, have used studies of organic matter in the Pacific Northwest, say along the coasts of Oregon and Washington, to date the occurrence of tsunamis that resulted from earthquakes in Japan. So the tsunamis would come ashore on the Northwest coastline, knock down trees, other vegetation, kill it off, and they could excavate these areas and identify where a tsunami had come through and use carbon dating and other methods to determine the year that that earthquake and resulting tsunami occurred. So biology, geology, a lot of sciences are being used to help engineers design better and safer structures. Be sure to check out the link in the description for my free download of the biggest civil engineering disasters in the last hundred years. And thanks for watching.